where you can interact with people much more freely. So um, this is a bit awkward in that I have no idea who you are or you know whether you're falling asleep, but please do interact through the Q and A um, if at all possible. So in terms of introducing this topic, um, when I was first getting involved in community energy, what attracted me to community energy was seeing the power that emerged when people come together to take action. I, you know, I was seeing communities across the world who were facing really big, really real, really challenging issues um, like climate change and like the decline of, you know, small regional communities. And these issues often feel completely overwhelming. They feel like they're um, out of our control. But, um, but you see people coming together and figuring out how to take action together, um, coming up with real solutions that led them to projects like Community Energy and projects that help them to feel empowered and to go on and take action in other areas as well. And I found that really inspiring. Um, some of the work I was doing at the time was in India. Um, and it was, it was just really inspiring to see what people can achieve when they come together. Um, I had been an activist involved in a lot of movements that said no to things. And I think it's really powerful when we come together and we say yes, and we create the world that we want to live in. And part of that process of creating the world we want to live in is about how we engage with each other, how we relate to each other, how we work together. Um, so it's that process side, that community energy, you know, that is a driving part of what community energy is about. And it's a lot of what makes community energy unique, um, is that, that social aspect of the project, of how people participate. Um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Um, so from, yeah, from this unique social aspect of community energy, because it's not just, you know, although we often focus a lot on the technology and the technological outcomes and being part of this transition to renewable energy, which is fantastic. Um, a lot of what we can achieve together is not just technical, it's social. And it's from that social aspect that come a whole range of outcomes that I feel are really unique to CORE. And what this webinar series is really all about is understanding the ways that we can design our projects um, so that we, we encourage, um, sorry, so that we really can encourage and make the most of those, those social outcomes. So it's going to be really analysing that link between enterprise design and participation and how that leads to social outcomes. So, you know, what social outcomes am I talking about? We like to use um, this diagram, you've probably all seen it before, but it's so those orange outcomes in the middle, things like um, empowerment and capacity building and skills development, increasing people's understanding of and support for renewable energy, um, increasing people's energy awareness and their, their behaviour towards how they use energy. It's also about increasing um, the connections in the community and doing community building and, and building that sense of local ownership and pride. So there's so many different possible social outcomes and they're often, you know, they're often a really key part of why we choose to engage in community energy. Um, and they're part of, of why participation is so important. So it's really, what my research found and what we'll be exploring through the webinar is that it's really participation, people's, the way that people engage and are involved, that facilitate and encourage that whole range of social outcomes. And those outcomes are really important because they help us to create the social context for a rapid transition to renewable energy. They help us build the political will to be able to push for better policies. They help us increase the level of benefit that stays locally in a, in, a, in a community. And they help us to transform people's sense of empowerment, both on an individual level, by having new skills and capacity, and at a collective level, by having that experience of, of working together and, and making significant change. 
Um, and it also builds community co connection and cohesion. And through, at the end of this, um, this session tonight, I'll talk about how my research, you know, through, through applying qualitative research methods, I was really able to explore the links between all of these types of outcomes and the way we design our enterprises. Yeah. So how do we do it? What's, what's the trick? You know, these are not automatic outcomes of core. They don't happen all the time. Um, and it's also fine if, if, if it's not a motivating, it's not something that you want to happen. It's fine if it doesn't happen. It doesn't need to happen out of every project. But if we do want these types of social outcomes, how can we better design our projects to building strong participation and help us realize those types of social outcomes? As I've mentioned, this, this webinar series is based on the outcomes of my PhD research. I did my PhD through um, the Faculty of Law and Built Environment at the University of New South Wales. And my research was all about trying to understand the local outcomes and impacts from community energy projects, and particularly from, um, from uh, operating community owned wind energy projects when what happens at in a local community when you've gone through this process together and what has been the influence of the way that that project has been set up the way that project has been designed um, and how has that influenced the types of outcomes and impacts that we see in communities um, so the research draws on four case studies in particular two from Australia and two in Scotland I'll introduce them in a moment um, but it involved in-depth and qualitative research. I went and stayed in each community for at least two weeks and did a lot of interviews, a lot of focus groups, ended up with way too much data. But what was really important was that I was able to explore this link um, really strongly between enterprise design, participation and social outcomes. So I'll just... I'm not going to talk through the case studies in a lot of detail, but the case studies you you're probably familiar um, with at least at least two of these. Um, so of course, Australia's two operating community owned wind energy projects, Hepburn Wind and Denmark Community Wind Farm over in WA. But also um, two in Scotland, <clears throat> Shappensea Development Trust and the Isle of Skye Renewables Cooperative. What was great about all of these projects is that they'd all been operating for a number of years. So I was able to, to see the outcomes that, that were being generated on the ground, not only through the development process, but also, um, uh, but also once the projects were up established and generating electricity and generating income and, you know, shifting, you know, you do a whole lot of different types of activities in the different stages of your projects. So, um, all four of them claim to be community projects that are really grounded in a in a local community and all of them um, are in small regional communities of 2,000 people or less so it sort of gave it's a bit of a, a test case you know it's a, a defined geographic region where I could I could talk to people from that region um, all of the projects were between one and five megawatts. So I guess there is a caveat that a lot of what I'm talking about here comes from findings from what, what are fairly large community energy projects. But from my experience, similar outcomes can emerge from much smaller projects as well. You know, 100 kilowatt solar, solar systems like Repower Shoalhaven and the like have similar dynamics going on. Um, but what was great about each of these projects is they actually varied a lot. They had a lot of variation in the types of legal structures and governance arrangements and their economic, the ways that they funded their projects and what they do with their, their income. Um, and they'd gone about community engagement in really different ways. And part of what informed the difference there was that they're motivated by really different things. So that diversity gave me a lot of perspective to analyze how, how does enterprise design make a difference um, to the realization of different outcomes. So I'm not going to talk a lot 
of detail about specific case studies this week because it's more of an introductory, introductory week. But the following weeks will draw very, a, a lot on very detailed aspects of each of these case studies. And I'll bring in some, um, some other examples as well from more recent Australian projects, including some of the, the projects that the community power hubs have been working on. So in the following weeks, we'll really you know, tease out and explore um, different aspects of governance arrangement, um, governance structures, economic arrangements, and community engagement practices. I just noticed there are some questions already, so I'll just um, quickly go in there and just see what they are in case. Okay. Um, my apologies, I am assuming that people have some level of exposure to, to CORE, um, which stands for Community Owned Renewable Energy, um, which was on the first slide, but not, not since. So yeah, CORE stands for Community Owned Renewable Energy. The other question I think we'll leave for now, and we'll come back to that when we're, when we're um, doing the, the fuller Q&A. I just wanted to check that you can see the slides and hear me okay and everything like that. Okay, so the next section that I'm going to speak about, speak through is um, the link between participation and enterprise design and what I mean by both of those terms. So I guess as sort of a, a context setting um, thing, a lot of what what drives community energy projects or community owned renewable energy projects. They start from a vision, um, from key motivations, from people in a community getting together and being motivated by something in common. Um, and that vision and those motivations feed into and influence the form that the project takes. Um, we at Community Power Agency have developed this diagram that you can see on the screen. Um, where your vision and values feed into four key aspects of your project design or what you could call your enterprise design. And they are um, your organisational structure and your governance. So I've been referring to this as governance structure. Your community engagement and communications. Your technical structures, which I'm not addressing in this webinar series at all and your economic arrangements or your finance and fundraising arrangements. And of course you're operating in a context and you need to, your project will also be influenced from, you know, equally by external factors to do with, you know, policy and regulation and available resources and all those sorts of things. But um, in terms of what's motivating the project, if your project is motivated by things like really wanting to take action together, wanting to empower people um, yeah, to take action on climate change, if you're wanting to win hearts and minds or bring people along and help them to understand and feel comfortable with renewable energy, all of those motivations that relate to the social outcomes, the social side of a project, um, they're the ones that we'll be focusing on here. So what do I mean in terms of enterprise design? Um, an enterprise is, is a word, you can use it, you can think of it sort of as, as business, but I use the word enterprise because these are values oriented businesses. So they're, they're, they're entities that operate in a market that, you know, that, that operate like businesses, but they're also more than that. They're, they're enterprises that are fundamentally motivated by by a vision and values as well. So I use, I use the phrase enterprise design to refer to the process of consciously designing um, an enterprise or an organization or a project to meet our practical and ethical requirements. And by ethical requirements, I mean those things, those values, and those motivations that we're driven by. So, Enterprise design involves considering values, ethics and motivations, as well as the contextual factors such as the regulation and the resource availability. And that's really that, what that diagram was representing in the last slide. Um, enterprise design is the process of designing a viable core project 
that, it's go that is going to be capable of delivering on our motivations. Um, so in this context, it means de designing, thinking through and establishing all of the different governance and legal and economic and finance and technical and community aspects that are going to make the core project work. And all those different pieces that need to come together. Um, so as introduced in that diagram, some of the, the different aspects of a project and the three aspects of the project that this webinar series is going to focus on are community engagement practices, governance arrangements, uh, sorry, governance structures and economic arrangements. So um, just to briefly introduce each of these so that you, you know what I'm talking about when I, when I talk about them. Um, community engagement is, you know, it's everything from workshops to events, forums, stalls at your local market, um, efforts to reach out to, to local schools and do education, or maybe local households doing education around energy efficiency. It might be tours of your project or of other projects. Anything that is a, a purposeful effort to reach out to the community. Um, you might also include your communications efforts as part of your community engagement. So, you know, running a, running a newsletter, a quarterly newsletter. Governance arrangements, um, sorry, governance structures, that should be, include your legal structure, but they also include more than that. So your legal structure is, you know, whether you choose to be a company or a cooperative or a not-for-profit association. Um, but governance is realised through more than legal structure. It's also things like your policies and processes as an organisation or the, even the culture that you develop as an organisation. But it might also be um, through seeking external certifications like, you know, similar to how the, the food movements has the fair trade certification. Some of you might have heard of the B Lab or the Benefit Corporation certification. Um, so governance structure is a, is a whole range of things, but it is really solidified in, within the legal structure that a project takes. Economic arrangements are used to refer to um, everything to do with where the money comes from and where the money goes. So, it, you know, it be donations or investment or loans. Um, it's your market interactions to do with selling your electricity. It's your labour arrangements, which might be paid or voluntary. Um, it's how you distribute your surplus or your profit, whether that goes back to your member shareholders or to the community or it's all of those, all of those things. So it includes a whole range of different practices, including volunteering and in-kind contributions and all of those kinds of things. So the way that that community energy projects approach each of these features will have ramifications for how participation is enabled or restricted within the project. So you have choices, right? You have choices for how you approach each of these things. And they're going to either open up space for people to be involved, or they're going to close down those opportunities. Um, and part of the point of this webinar series is so that you all can make really conscious decisions when you're designing your projects, so that your projects are more likely to deliver and perform in the way that you want them to. So I visualise a community owned renewable energy enterprise like this. It's a, yeah, so basically you've, you've got your your overall project, your overall enterprise. Underneath that, you have these four aspects that I introduced earlier. We're, we're focusing in this webinar series on those first three. So there's those three aspects that we're focusing on, community engagement, economic arrangements, and governance structures. And then underneath those are specific features. So for example, under your community engagement, a feature might be, we run a, a wind farm tour you know, every every couple months, or we host um, a market stall every week. Um, under your economic arrangements, a feature might be that we have a, you know, we, we issued a share offering, or it might be that we have a grant, um, our project has a community grant fund. So there's 
each of these features and together they help to build up, you know, they, together they build the enterprise. So this tiered understanding helps us think about how an enterprise is built up through bringing together a bunch of different features. And each of those features offer a potential interface for participation. So, what do I mean when I say participation? I mean all of the ways through which people actively contribute to a project. It's inherently an active role. It requires a purposeful contribution of ideas, time, effort, money, or other resources. Um, participation is not always positive, it's not always easy, it's not always desirable. Um, and I will be talking through some of the ways that it's problematic um, later on in, in the webinar. But participation can happen in, in a variety of ways in any community energy project and no two projects are the same. Um, and as I've already said heaps of times, the different ways that you can foster participation, um, like there's so many different ways you can foster participation through the ways that you design the different aspects of your enterprise. So sort of bring this all home um, as a, and a really great way to, to introduce what it is that I'm really talking about here. Um, I'm going to read through this example. So this is a, a story that came out from one of my uh, interview participants from Hepburn Wind. I've changed her name for the purposes of confidentiality. I'm going to read this story and as I go along, I want you to look at the dot points in the column on the right hand side. So um, you follow along there. That column is the feature of enterprise design that's enabling the type of participation that this person is experiencing through being involved in the community energy project. Okay, so Sharon is deeply committed to sustainability and she strongly believes that we need to transition to renewable energy quickly if we are to avoid the worst of climate change. She also believes that people should take responsibility for the impacts of their resource use, including electricity generation and its externalities. Previously, most of her town's electricity came from a coal mine and a coal power station 250 kilometres away, right next to a small town not unlike her own. Other people had to live with the visual health and noise impacts of that energy production in addition to the negative global effects of climate change. Sharon has grandchildren and is very concerned about the world that they will experience as they grow older. She's frustrated by the government's changeable and inadequate approach to addressing climate change. And she feels the best way to take action is through collective community level projects. When she heard about the idea of a community owned wind farm, she was excited and decided to find out more. She went along to early community meetings to gather interest and ideas. She contributed her ideas to the process and helped to articulate the project vision and its values. She stayed up to date through regular newsletters and running into people who held stalls almost every Saturday near the local shops. As the idea for Hepburn Wind progressed, she volunteered when she could, mostly at community events. She helped to organise a float for a local parade to help spread information and knowledge about the project. When the cooperative was established and the project sought members to invest money in order to build the turbines, she invested as much as she could. She also bought shares for each of her four grandchildren. For her, this investment is an investment in the future for a sustainable world and the expected, if modest, returns would help her in her retirement. When she receives new newsletters, she reads them diligently because she is a, co a cooperative owner and investor and she likes to stay up to date and able to participate in an informed way when opportunities arise, such as at the annual general meetings. If she has questions, she asks 
staff and they give her clear answers. She gives her feedback because that's what the project wants. And when they ask for member input through surveys or through newsletters, um, she contributes her ideas. She volunteers at events such as the celebration held to open the wind farm. Her granddaughter's school was part of the competition to name the turbines and they all came along as well. When the project came under hard financial times because of policy change, she participated in the decision to prioritise paying down the cooperative's debt over paying a return to members. She also supported the decision to maintain their commitment to ensuring the community grants could give it, uh, the community grants fund could give out its thirty thousand dollars a year. When she sees the turbines, she feels proud to belong to this community. It's given us a sense of pride and solidarity. She says, "Being involved in something like this is a privilege. How many people can live in a community that sets up something like this?" that welcomes involvement. When the opportunities arise to participate in petitions or political advocacy for conditions to support renewable energy, renewable energy, action on climate change or community owned renewable energy, she does. She told her story about why she's involved and why the turbines mean so much to her to a parliamentary review panel. This is not something that she would always have, that she would have done before or on her own. So what I'm trying to illustrate with this story, what you can see through this story, through this, um, is that participation um, is a lived experience for the people involved, but it's facilitated by the enterprise design choices that have been made along the way. And I'm just hoping that that, that story sort of helped that link come alive for you. I think what else is interesting is you can see how her own personal motivations and the reasons why she's involved in the, in the community energy project are woven through and related to the structures within the community energy enterprise. And so that, that helps build a really strong link. All right, this is the last slide before question time. Um, it's offering a summary of the many ways that people can participate in a community energy project and the many features of an enterprise that facilitate this. So um, it's broken up into our three aspects of enterprise design, community engagement, governance structure and economic arrangements. And the forms of participation are that first column. So they're the, the many different ways that people can participate in a community energy project. And the next column over is the feature of features of enterprise design that enable that participation. So this is just a quick overview and a summary. Um, the following three webinars will be going into this content in a lot more detail and teasing out the different choices and you know variations that you can go with um, when you're designing each of those aspects. But in essence, it's just important to remember that um, through the various features of enterprise design, people participate in many ways. So they might be project owners, they might be part of the, the management, the, the decision making, they might contribute to the social life of the enterprise, or they might um, contribute to its financial viability by being shareholders. So so many different ways. Um, and that participation is, is inherently in a community energy project is multi-dimensional and multifaceted faceted it's not just a single moment or a single event um, it goes on over time and that's part of that's part of what's really important um, so what we'll talk about in the next section is um understanding and thinking about participation and, and the way that it's interrelated with enterprise design. 
But we're just going to pause now for some questions. Um, so there's a few waiting there. Do I have examples from the suburbs? I do have examples from the suburbs. Um, I won't be speaking to any of them particularly right in, in this webinar today, but I'll try and bring that in in the webinars um, in the future weeks. I guess from my experience, um, no two projects are the same, but a lot of projects share common features and those common features can can lead to common outcomes so i think that the learnings from my research which was in a regional setting all of the projects in regional settings i think they can um they can be applied um they can be applied and understood in the context of of urban settings and suburbs so another question um how do you see Community Energy Australia in Australia interfacing with the need to develop circular economy? That's a great question. Um, I think what I'll do is leave that question to talk about in the economic arrangements webinar um, because it's a little bit tangential to the topic for tonight, but it will really fit with the topic. Um, I'm not sure what week that is. I think it might be the third week um, where we're talking about economic arrangements. Um, the final question that's there at the moment is um, surprised that participation as a consumer is not mentioned. Um, good point. The yep, absolutely, that's a very valid way to participate in a community energy project, particularly for projects that are behind the meter. So um, you know, solar projects, for example, like the the projects, a lot of them have been done. A lot of them that have been done all over Australia, um, installing 100 kilowatt solar arrays on the roof of a large energy user. That energy user then buys the electricity from the community energy group. So, in that sense, um, consuming the electricity and buying the electricity is, is an important form of participation. Um, the reason I haven't brought it up is because all of the projects that I draw on in my research all fed, fed electricity into. The grid so they were exporting all of the electricity that they were generating they didn't have that direct relationship with the consumer but you're absolutely right it is an important and relevant way to participate in many community energy projects but not all okay um i'll just let you all think for a moment while i get a little drink and maybe another couple questions might come through Okay, well, if there's no more questions for now, I guess we'll, we'll continue. Um, Ella, would you mind taking note of Natalie's question um, and making sure we come back to it in, in the next, in the appropriate webinar? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Thank you. I'll just dismiss that one for now. Thanks, Natalie. Okay, oh, here's a question. Um, what do you see is the main difference in the community, main difference of the community participating to commercial participation? Um, I, think, I think that by the time we get to the end of the webinar, that will probably become evident. Um, I guess one of, one of the first things that comes to mind for me is that in a community energy project, participation is going to be a lot more diverse. There's going to be a lot more different opportunities for different ways that people can participate. Um, you know, in a, in a standard commercial relationship to do with energy, you're really assigned certain quite specific roles and beyond that, there's not really much you can do. Um, in addition, the participation you might have in a community energy project can have a big impact. So, and we'll, we'll talk about 
we'll talk about more of this as, as we go through the webinar. So I think I'll leave that question for now um, because I think it will become clear as we go along. All right, thanks everyone for your questions. That's great. <clears throat> so the next section here is looking at um, how we understand and think about participation. So um, through, through my research and my analysis of community energy, I've come up with this <clears throat> method called a participation footprint. Um, and it's really, you know, through analysing the community engagement practices and the governance structure and the economic arrangements of different community energy projects, um, I've been able to develop this, this, um, yeah, this method that helps us to see how much participation and what types of participation is going on. So it's a way of mapping the many diverse opportunities that exist for participation within a community energy project or within you know any enterprise really you could use it for um, <clears throat> as you'll see it involves setting a range of criteria that tease apart the various forms of participation that, that are going on within a project um, and it represents the differences in participation it's got um, visually across a range of different indicators and what this allows us to do is to look holistically at how across all of the different things going on in the enterprise how is participation either enabled or restricted so this is what i'm talking about <clears throat> um, i'm going to talk you through it we're going to be on this slide for a while so don't get don't get too overwhelmed but basically these what you're seeing there is um, each of the different lines represents a different community energy project from the four case. They're the four case studies in my PhD research. So the blue line is, is HEP, my analysis of HEP and wind. The red line is Denmark Community Wind Farm. The green line is Shappensee Trust from Scotland. Um, and the purple line is the Sky Co-op. And I know you don't know very much about each of these projects right now, but that's not too important at this point. This is just using those, you know, this is just a, an example. So what you can see is there's a visual way of analyzing how much, what extent have the different projects um, facilitated participation relating to each of those different points. So, um, each of the radial lines, each of the arms of that spider web represents a different feature of community engagement, economic arrangements or governance structure. So um, these are things like local ability to influence decisions, local involvement in setting the vision and design, percentage of local ownership, um, the number of people regularly contributing time and effort. So there's a whole different range of indicators. The inside of the web is a weaker level of participation and the outside of the web is a stronger level of participation. So you can think of each of those arms as a spectrum. Um, so, you know, for example, um, the number of individuals, organisations and services benefiting from a community fund. Um, the different projects had different numbers of organisations. So in some, in some, for some indicators, this is a numbers game. So there was a lot of people um, in Chappancy, so it's right on the outside. Whereas in Sky, there was very few people um, benefiting from their community funds. So there closer towards the middle. The point here is not who is furthest inside or outside. It's rather how the projects perform relative to each other, because that's what helps us to understand the influence of different choices around enterprise design on the overall level of participation enabled through the project. So it helps you build up a multifaceted multi-dimensional understanding of how participation is enabled in a project. You know, it's not just one thing, it's a lot of things that contribute to this overall participation footprint.
um, so the indicators I've used are indicators that related or came up in the case studies that I was working with. These are not, the, these indicators are indicative. So rather than being comprehensive or prescriptive, like if you're, you know, in a different context, you might come up with different indicators that are relevant. But the point is that each of them tease out um, and collate the participatory aspects of that project or of that enterprise. Um, so as we go through the following week's content, so in the, in the next three weeks, we'll be talking about each of these aspects in detail. So I'm not going to talk through them each in detail now, but I just want to give you a sense of what this participation footprint is about and what it can show us. So in a basic sense, the larger the footprint area, so the larger that area included within the line. So imagine that everything inside the purple line was filled in. Everything inside the, the red and green line was filled in. So the larger the shape created by that line, more local participation has occurred over time by more people. So all of the indicators require some form of active involvement, whether as a co-owner or a decision maker or an attendee or a beneficiary or someone contributing time, labour, ideas. But the closer to the centre of web, more participation has been restricted. And the closer, the further you are to the outside, the more participation has been really actively encouraged and enabled. So this is how, how I've conceptualised participation. Um, some of you might be familiar with the spectrum of public participation, which is a more, um, this is a more conventional way that participation is normally thought about. Um, and if you've worked in community development or community engagement, you will have seen this before. This version of the spectrum for public participation um, was adapted by Taryn Lane and myself when we were working with the ACT government on their reverse auction. Um, but basically this spectrum goes from, from one end um, that represents uh, a low level of power and influence through to um, at the inform end through to a high level of power and influence at the empower end. So it's really focused on looking at how much power and influence the community has in a decision. And usually it's in a decision being made by someone else, you know, so the government's out there um, wanting to get input on a plan. They can just inform you. They can consult you where they, they you know, ask for people's feedback, they don't necessarily commit to integrating it. They might involve you where they actually, it is a dynamic process where you can contribute ideas and they're taken on board. Um, or you can collaborate where that feedback, you have a little bit more power to determine the outcome, but still really the decisions are in someone else's hands through to um, the furthest position on the spectrum, which is empowering people so they say you guys make the decision we'll implement what you decide so this is a classic way of thinking about participation um, and it was developed originally by a woman called Einstein back in 1969 um, and it was really developed in the context of citizens or communities participating in other people's projects so, you know, in projects of corporates or government. Um, and what I found when I was thinking about community energy groups, community energy projects where they are community driven, was that this spectrum just didn't cut it. It wasn't, it was actually, wasn't, it wasn't that helpful in helping me understand the detail of what's really going on, the nuance of what's really going on and understanding, well, what's really the difference you know, for example, if we, a lot of projects, if you look at them according to the, the spectrum of public participation, um, they would all be considered to be empowering the local community. 
So they might all be implementing the ideas of the community for the benefit of the community. But if you look closer within each of those community energy projects, the dynamics of participation vary a lot um, and produce really different social outcomes. And it's, I want to understand what makes that difference. So I found that there were a number of shortfalls with um, the spectrum of public participation, which is IAP2's spectrum. Um, and as I said, one of the issues was that it was created in the, for a context of community participating in someone else's program or project, rather than the community creating their own project together. And it condenses what is multidimensional and multifaceted and diverse ways that people participate in a community energy project into a one dimensional judgment of just one place on a spectrum that relates to the entire project. So I felt, I felt that it oversimplified a highly complex set of processes and interactions that go on within a project or within an enterprise. Um, and so it didn't really help me to understand, didn't help us as practitioners to, to, to understand the range of things that's really going on and the range of things that really influences the social outcomes from a community energy project. And I feel that the participation footprint does this a lot better. Um, it helps us to see the detail and the depth that we need um, to get a holistic understanding of, of what's going on within the enterprise and how people in the community are able to, to be involved and the power that they're having um, in that process. So, um, I feel that when we're thinking about participation, um, and one thing that the, the, in developing the footprint, um, the participation footprint, what it helped me to realize was that we can add depth to the way we think about participation by thinking about four dimensions that emerge as being really fundamental to creating stronger participation in our organizations. So one of those dimensions is a, is a time dimension. It's about how participation is sustained over time, over the life of the project, through the different phases of the project. Another dimension is that it's local and it's collective. So it involves groups of local people, local people working together, building connections and relationships. Another um, dimension is around the impact. Um, and this is, you know, what, what impact does their participation have on the project, on the enterprise? How important is their participation to the project? Um, oh, and the final one is a dimension of diversity. So um, does it include a whole range of different means um, across you know, across the many different aspects of the enterprise. And I'll talk about each of these um, in a little bit more detail. So I think that it's important to think about participation over time. So how it's sustained over time. So that's both longevity, but also the regularity of, of opportunities for participation. So this might be things like, you know, you send out um, a quarterly newsletter, but you also have a yearly celebration and you do stalls at um, the, the monthly market. So it's having that, those touchstones that continue over time that give your, engage, your participation opportunities longevity. Um, but also that it's, you know, it's not just a one-off event. It's not just, oh, we held a forum and that's it, you know. Um, and there was a whole bunch of indicators in the participation footprint that relate to this dimension of participation. So I think one of the really important things in building your community around a project is how you engage with people over time and continue to provide those opportunities. You know, you won't, you'll, you'll continue to pick up people along the way. Um, the dimension of being local and collective is the importance of the fact that the project emerges from the local community. 
Um, so it's not imposed from the outside. It's, it emerges from the local community and it has opportunities for people to work together in group settings. Um, and that those, those settings really reach out to and try to involve people beyond just the people who are on the board. Um, so this, you know, for example, this is, this is things about, you know, who and how many people are involved in initiating the project and setting the vision for the project and who and how many people are involved in an ongoing way in the decisions um, and, and how many people and um, are able to be involved in group deliberative group processes like forums and worlds where people come together and they have to work it out together. Um, so this element of, of being grounded in place but also working together, that's, a, that's an important dimension of participation and a range of the indicators from the, the participation footprint related to this dimension. Um, and then there's the dimension of impact. So this is about the level of impact that participation has on various aspects of the project. So it might be that by participating, people have decision-making power over the project. They can li they're literally able to help make decisions that inform the shape of that project and the future of that project. Um, but it also might be, you know, by donating money or by investing money, your participating in making that project financially viable. Same if you're volunteering time. Um, so a, a contrasting example, for example, um, might be um, if a community energy project invests in a larger wind farm. So one of my case studies at the Isle of Skye case study, it, um, that co-op owned a small share in a much bigger wind farm. So the impact of their financial participation, of them buying shares, didn't really influence the project very much. It was still good because it enabled local people to, to be part of it and kept some of the financial benefit locally, but the impact of their participation was smaller. So in terms of this dimension, it wouldn't have performed as strongly. Um, the, um, the aspect of diversity is important because this is all about how a project creates multiple impactful, sustained opportunity for many people to contribute um, in lots of different ways over time. So it's about how do we get as much diversity in terms of who's participating and how are they participating, what they're participating in and what that contributes to. So as I've said before, a single feature a lot or aspect alone doesn't determine the extent that people will participate in a project. Rather, um, participation is an outcome of, of many different elements of the enterprise and how they, how they interplay with each other. Um, so in this sense, it's, yeah, it's multifaceted and it's multidimensional. And it goes beyond single decisions or, or a shallow level of engagement. Um, so, in this sense, people are involved in lots of different ways. They are simultaneously decision makers, owners, partners, contractors, volunteers, staff. They, they simultaneously fulfil multiple of those roles. There are, of course, challenges to participation as well. Um, there's, there's often a challenge around, um, you know, participation can just be seen as face value and it's all talk and no impact. Um, it can be seen as, you know, a cloak of words. It's just, yeah, there's no, you go out there and you engage, but then what do you actually do with the information, you know? And this is a challenge where there's an inconsistency between the community engagement, which goes out and wants you to, you know, goes out and has conversations and the governance structure where there's actually no opportunity for those conversations to inform the decision making. So that's a challenge. Um, another challenge is that participation takes time. And sometimes, you know, people who are time poor, they contribute time. What do they get back? How do they benefit from the project? 
Um, and this might be seen as an inconsistency or a mismatch between the community engagement process where people contribute their time and the economic arrangements where they don't get any benefit from that, from that contribution. Um, it also, it takes time, knowledge and resources to even be able to create opportunities for participation. So, you know, if you're a community energy um, project and you're just getting going, you might not have experience in this. You might not have the time to do it. It might be sidelined in the context of all of the other things you're trying to get done. Um, and similarly, it takes time to participate. So, you know, if you're a, a single mum at home with kids, it might be really hard for you to get out unless they're offering free childcare at the event, you know. Um, so there are, of course, these are just some of the challenges. There's a lot of other challenges. But I wanted to, to sort of frame these challenges in the sense of starting to think about the, the relationships between different aspects of your project, making sure that they're matching up. So if you want to involve a lot of people and you want them to, to genuinely influence the project and have impact on the decisions, then your governance structure and your community engagement practices need to meet and allow that to happen. For example. Okay. Question time. Um, we have some more. Uh, the blue line was incomplete in the in the footprint. That's because it was hiding behind the green line. Um, the program just wouldn't show both of them if one was hiding behind it. Um, Where did the ACT government reverse auction fit on the spectrum? I'm not sure about that. Um, we, in the context of the ACT auction, the spectrum was used to analyze the projects that applied for the, for the so, you know, all the, the different renewable energy projects that applied to, um, to the reverse auction process, part of what they were judged on was how they'd gone about their community engagement and their benefit sharing. Um, so we used that as a framework to understand how much, the way that they, that that project had related to the local community. Um, yeah, okay, so what do you see as the main difference? This is a question from before. What do you see as the main difference of the community participating to commercial participation? So based on what I just said, I would say the, the biggest differences are the level of impact that community participation has on a community energy project is a lot, a lot, a lot more significant than what a someone trying to participate in an, a, a usual commercial development process. Um, also, it's going to be a lot more diverse. There's going to be a lot more opportunities, a lot more different opportunities, different ways to participate, um, different roles that people can play through that participation in a community energy project than in a commercial setting. Um, I hope that answers the question. It's really hard not having a level of easy interactivity with with all of you. Um, what I'm going to do now, we're just going to pause for five minutes. Um, we've got one section to go, which is about the findings. Um, so what are the outcomes, the social outcomes that that we see when community energy projects do really deep and really strong participation. Um, so yeah, five minute break. Come back here at um, 10 past seven and we'll do the last section of the of the seminar so there's been three sections we'll do the last section um followed by q a and then um just talk you through briefly the plan for the next three webinars after that so see you all in a few minutes
Okay. Just give half a minute for people who are still finding their seats. So what I'm going to talk through now is um, what I found from, from the outcomes of my research, which was really a very in-depth and qualitative study into what happens in communities that have gone through this process together of setting up community-owned renewable energy projects. Um, and what I understood, what I came to understand was that participation, people's participation in the project is a real seed for a variety of different really important social outcomes. Um, so what I found was that there's a correlation between diverse, meaningful, impactful opportunities for local participation and the strength to which local people reported social outcomes, such as an increased sense of empowerment, um, increased capacity and skills, increased sense of community and cohesion, and increased positive associations with wind technology. So all of these different types of social outcomes were stronger where participation was stronger. So where the participation footprint was larger, um, these social outcomes were experienced more strongly and more of them were experienced. Where the participation footprint was smaller, they were experienced less strongly and less of the social outcomes were experienced. Um, and again, this is not a judgment thing. It's not like you have to achieve all of these social outcomes or you're not a good community energy project. It's not like that. This is simply a way of trying to understand more about if we want those outcomes, if we want so those social outcomes, how do we design our projects um, to generate those social outcomes? How do we understand the link between how we set up our project, how we set up our enterprise um, and the social outcomes we deliver? And I found that that link is through strong participation, participation that is sustained over time, that is diverse, that is collective and local, um, and that is, what was my other dimension? It's getting late, I can't remember. <laughs> this is where if it was a workshop, you'd just be able to tell me, because one of you would remember and I can't remember. <laughs> Anyway, the point is that where participation is diverse and sustained over time ah, and impactful, as powerful, um, then, then there's more social outcomes experienced in a richer and a deeper way. So, um, what I found, and this is, this is some thesis speak, but indulge me for a moment. What I found was that Diverse and meaningful ways to participate builds a rich web of interactions and contributions. So lots of different connections that act as opportunities for local people to develop a personal connection with the project and with other people. So that participation helps to build relationships and connections. And those connections become the foundation of experiences of empowerment and identity creation that has the potential to redefine how people feel and act as members of their community and participants in energy change. I'm gonna unpack this as we go along. But um, in a nutshell, it's that experience of participation that enables people to really connect with others and to connect with the technology. And that's the opportunity for them to rethink how they understand themselves and what they're capable of, um, to understand how to take action with other people, what you can achieve together. Um, so it relates to a whole bunch, informs a whole bunch of social outcomes. So some of these outcomes are a sense of increased capacity and skills. Um, so by virtue of being involved, people develop a whole range of knowledge and skills. And so, if you're a general member, even just through receiving the newsletters, if you're a board member or a, an active volunteer, then you might have developed a range of skills across 
so many different elements of a project that you knew nothing about before. And these, this capacity and these knowledge and the skills can be applied to future initiatives. And I heard stories about people who now know how to set up co-op, so they're going on and doing that and setting up other co-ops. Um, for people who now understand how to do an energy audit, so they're going on and they're doing more energy audits. Um, and it increases, through having those skills, it increases your capacity to go and make change. Other change, you know, to other issues that you care about in your community. Another outcome is um, democrat democratising energy decision making and energy development. So, um, where the participation involves many people um, and involves them in decision making, and most of those people are local local people, then you're building the ability for local people to make decisions about their energy future. This is particularly the case if there's in a co-op where there's, you know, a, a one member, one vote rule. And what part of the importance of this is that it teaches us democratic skills. It teaches people the importance of how to relate to each other in spaces of decision making. Um, and, you know, this might not be the case for every community energy project, but certainly some, in, it teaches people those democratic skills that we can then apply in other parts of our citizenry and our lives. Um, another social outcome is that it's um, community energy projects and the ability to participate in them changes people's attitudes to energy and to technologies. And all of my case studies were case studies with, with um, large commercial scale wind turbines where you know sometimes people are concerned about how how you know what local attitudes to to wind turbine development's going to be but what i found is that people's attitudes to the technology is mediated by their experience of them and what they mean to them um, and where people have been involved and where they've you know they've had some power over the project power in the project and they're benefiting from that project then those turbines actually become symbols of hope and community action and a positive future and every time they see them they think of you know another penny in the bank or they think of a stronger future for the earth and their children or so that power for the turbines to become a symbol of of something really positive and for people to relate to those those turbines in really positive ways um, but it's also um, in terms of changing attitudes to energy it's about general energy education and awareness that has flow on effects in people's lives in their homes and in their businesses changing their their general behavior towards attitude um, behavior towards how they use energy but also how they're able then to think about and engage with system level energy change in you know in society um, it also another social outcome redistributes power and agency so um, through through involving people in the project it builds local capacity to deliver projects to set up new organizations um, that can then be transferred to other areas, to other non-related um, efforts at, for, that are important to the local community. Um, other social outcomes that, that were evident, um, building social cohesion. So building people's sense of community, of being a community, with other people through having a common purpose and that common purpose relating to something that they really cared about. So that common vision that motivates the project brings people together and it fosters meaning and by, by people through the community energy project being able to meet other people that share your values, share your concerns, um, that builds connection and relationship in new ways and builds people's that sense of community. But also, people also reference the, the emotional value of, of coming together and supporting each other, um, of taking an issue that felt overwhelming to now being an issue that, that feels like they can take action, they can have impact, and they're not alone, they can do it together. 
Um, also income, um, outcomes to do with this sense, not only of having a stronger community, but building that sense of identity. So as I said before, where the turbines become a symbol of pride, a symbol of what, they're, what their community is about and what they're doing and what they care about. Um, and a symbol of their, their ability to take action together. Um, another important outcome that arose from participation was um, mobilising people into the political process. So um, through the Community Energy Project, people becoming more informed, caring more about the issues, but also the fact that they now have this platform, this organisation, where they can, from which they can engage in the in energy policy and decision making, they can engage in public dialogue. Um, and, you know, Hepburn Wind has been a great example of this in terms of their participation in a whole bunch of policy reviews, but including the Renewable Energy Target Review and really mobilising their membership. Um, and the other side of that is also just being a case study and inspiring others into action. And we're now at a place in Australia where um, you know, Hepburn Wind was the first operating community energy project that we know of um, and they came online in 2011 and now we have over 100 operating community energy projects. So um, I think we can say we are genuinely creating a movement and a lot of what helps perpetuate that is people's participation in, in community energy projects. So um, I'm going to wrap it up now, really. I just wanted to mention that um, I've said this a few times, but not all of these social outcomes and not all of the forms of participation I've mentioned are present in every core project, every community energy project. And that's, that's totally fine, of course. Um, but social outcomes are stronger and more diverse where the participation has been deeper where their participation footprint is larger. Um, and as we go through the next weeks, next three weeks of content, we'll go from this sort of, this has been abstract and theoretical and general introduction. The next three weeks are going to focus on, okay, so how, what are our different choices when we think about designing our um, governance structure, our economic arrangements and our community engagement practices. What are our choices and how do we think about um, ways to both to, to enable participation through through our design, through the choices that we're making. So I'm going to leave it there for now and call for questions. We have um, another seven minutes before we're done here, so um, no negatives. Uh, yeah, of course, there are, there are always, um, <laughs> there are always going to be some negatives. I guess I haven't chosen um, to focus on those. Um, to be honest, in the case studies involved in my research, I didn't come across negative social outcomes. So all of the projects had gone through a phase where they needed to have conversations in the community and they had to work through issues of, of opposition. Um, and I, I interviewed quite a few people who, you know, when the project was first proposed, they felt really wary about wind turbines close to them or, you know, they just, they, they felt wary about the project. But through the process, um, and through enabling participation, those people had been able to work through their issues and, and overcome them. So, um, but there did also remain some people in the community who, who still had concerns. And I think um, that that is a reality you need to work with. But I guess, again, I would say that participation is a way to, um, to try to bring those people in and to, um, to give you the best chance of being able to work through it respectfully. Um, and then there are a few comments. No other questions. If uh, you can still um, feel free to pose a question, happy to still take them. Um, 
while we're waiting for new questions, I'll just mention quickly that in terms of what's coming up next, um, so next week, <clears throat> week two's webinar is talking about economic arrangements. Um, so as I said before, this is everything relating to where the money comes from and where the money goes to from a community energy project. Um, the week after that, we'll be talking about governance structures, which is both um, choices around your, your legal structure, but also within that, um, different choices you have around, you know, who are your members, shareholders, how your how's your voting rights attributed, what are your thresholds for decision making, um, what are your rules for quorum, you know, all of these things build up and they, they end up having a, a tangible and real influence on how participation is enabled or restricted. And then in week four, we'll be, um, we'll be looking at community engagement practices. So a lot of people, when you think participation, you go immediately to community engagement. Um, but what, what we'll be exploring is the multifaceted way you really build participation into your whole project, your whole enterprise. So there's, um, there's a couple other questions come in here. I'm wondering whether the effort of creating community participation is worthwhile. Do you think a commercial approach might get to renewable energy results more quickly? Um, well, Alex, um, I think that large scale renewable energy have their part, but I think community energy is unique and offers unique, um, op like, unique social outcomes. I personally would argue that those social outcomes are really important and you cannot achieve them through a standard commercial project. Um, and if you look at the, the status of the renewable energy transition in Australia and the fact that it needs to happen faster and um, it needs to enable, it, it needs to share the benefits more broadly with everyone, we're not gonna get there without citizens driving this process. Our politics is not leaving, leading. Um, so unless you're creating those social conditions of support, um, I think we're going to have a hard time realising our renewable energy ambitions. And it's, it's, it's that social, those social outcomes that are so important from community energy that I think play into um, Building, building that base of support that will drive the renewable energy transition and making sure that everybody has the opportunity to, to benefit from it and be involved in it. Um, question, another question here. Did you only interview people who lived within the actual communities where the installations were situated? Many of the case studies had considerable participation by non-locals. Um, no, I predominantly interviewed lo people who were local, but I also interviewed um, people who were non-local. Um, but I was, I spent time, I spent two, at least two weeks with each case study. So a lot of that was about um, being able to witness those local dynamics, that the, the dynamics between people at meetings and at events. And um, But I did also interview um, and some of the focus group people were people who'd been involved in the projects but lived somewhere else. Yeah. Um, so that's that's it, I think. Oh no, one more question here. Are there studies comparing communities who have control over communities who do not have control? Um, there are studies that compare community energy projects with commercial projects. Um, most of the studies I know that relate community and commercial projects look either at the different levels of economic benefit that community ownership brings versus or corporate ownership um, and its magnitudes higher when it's owned by a community. Um, and looking at the different social, um, what's called social license, so the different local attitude and reception and level of support for a project when it is community owned versus corporate owned. Um, and research, lots of different research projects consistently show that where local people are involved in a project, they have um, some ownership, some power, some influence, and they're benefiting from project, as is the case with community energy projects, then they are so much more likely 
um, to be very supportive of of the project and and for that project to be you know yeah well supported through the development process so i would say they're some of the the main differences that have been studied between community energy and and corporate projects um we might take this as the final question um which is if a core project that was implemented did not have strong community participation, is it worthwhile doing it post implementation? Um, yeah, I think it's always worth starting. <laughs> I think um, a lot of the, the richness that can come, you know, it's worth starting early, but it's also worth starting wherever you're at. Um, I think um, the range of outcomes that you're able to produce when you, when you, really involve people is going to be richer. All right, there was a final question was, is the list of attendees available to all attendees? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I imagine not. Other question? Um, Susan, I, I'm sorry we can't answer that question. <laughs> we may be able to answer it for you in the next um, the next webinar. So we'll, if we get an answer to it, we'll let you know. Um, in the meantime, I hope that you've hope you've found this interesting and look forward to you joining us for the future week's webinars. Um, uh, one final thing I will say is that um, if you're wanting to look up. My thesis, if, you're a, if you've got a, a desire to read a lot of content on what we've just been talking about, that's the link there, along with my contact details. Um, and yeah, look forward to getting into sort of the nuts and bolts and the more, the more practical um, elements of thinking about participation in the coming weeks. Thank you, Dara. Thank Wonderful, you, Dara. Presentation. Wonderful presentation.